Let's get this sports podcast party started, all right? The J Reels Podcast. What is happening, my good people? Greetings. How are you? How's it going? How's everybody doing out there? What is the latest and greatest? Hope everybody's doing well, feeling fantastic, in excellent spirits. My third podcast this week has a very special guest and one that has a compelling and fascinating story, his trajectory, his journey through the ranks of getting to where he is right now, and that is sports talk show host in the best and the original OG sports talk radio station in the nation, that being WFAN here in New York, and none other than Keith McPherson joins me to unpack a lot of his journey. And for those out there who are wondering, wow, I know who this guy is. I've seen him. He's been around. I can't wait to see what Jay Reel is going to talk about when it comes to sports. Well, I'm going to have to pump the brakes on that a bit because for the first 45 minutes of the hour-long conversation that I had with him, a lot of it was about him moving up the ranks, him getting to the point where he is today, going through a lot of what he had to go through, to roll up his sleeves, to get in the muck, to put his name out there. He talks about branding. He talks about having to just do all the dirty work, whether it's on other people's podcasts, whether it's joining the MLB Fan Cave. Remember that? Down in Lower Manhattan for the MLB Network? Yes, he even did that. And to the point to where he got to WFAN, creating his own luck, I'm telling you people, this is a conversation that will get anybody pumped up. Because we all like to see the underdog. We all like to see somebody work hard to get to where they want to go. Sounds familiar, people? Yours truly, right here. But in all seriousness, for Keith McPherson to join me, and this is someone that has been on my radar for quite some time, and when he joined me and unpacked all those things that I had mentioned, let me tell you something, I could have talked to him for four hours. And one more time, we didn't even get into his beloved Yankees, although... When we recorded this was a week ago when the Yankees were playing the Phillies, that third game where the Yankees were able to sweep the Phillies out of Philadelphia. So we'll touch on that. We'll touch on his love for the Phillies. We'll even touch on the bleacher creatures, the roll call, which obviously was enormous for Keith as they called his name while, get ready for this people, filling in for Susan Waldman on the radio for a Yankee broadcast. So you know that this conversation is going to be off the chain. Also, one other note. I do want to mention, if you're watching this on Spotify or on my YouTube channel, at J Reels, there is a bit of a lag over the first three and a half, four minutes of the discussion. We had to tweak some settings there when it comes to the video, but please, just bear with us, be patient. Once that's fixed, after the first four minutes, the audio is in sync with the video, so please, don't jump ship. Go to those channels, whether it's on YouTube, at J Reels, or Spotify, if you like to watch it for the visually inclined, please be patient. Just stick out those first few minutes and I assure you that the recording from then on out will be as smooth as a whistle. So without further ado, I'm excited, I'm pumped up and I hope you are as well. My conversation with Keith McPherson and I will see you on the other end of this discussion. All right, Keith, so let's get right to it. Before I even talk about your journey through the broadcasting landscape, of course, the way you are, late night host there at WFN in New York, which I'm sure a lot of people obviously in the tri-state area know who you are. And if the people outside, I'm sure they have an idea who you are. But tell us your origins as far as the love of sports that you have. What was the one watershed moment, I'm sure as a boy, that the light went off and said, wait a minute kind of like this thing, whether it be baseball, I know you're a huge Yankee fan, maybe that was the starting point. Please tell us your journey as a fan and how you got to the point where you loved a particular sport or just sports overall. Yeah, I would say in the mid nineties, I started to really watch sports on TV. And then I would go outside and play with my friends, football, basketball, baseball, really a little bit of street hockey, you know, and then also play video games, you know, play Madden, play NHL, uh, the show, um, it wasn't the show back then. We had other baseball games. But, you know, just being a kid who gravitated towards sports, I was athletic. And 
I don't know. It just always did something for me. I just I was always gravi- gravitating to games on TV, playing sports, video games, going outside and playing, playing at recess. And then by the time I was old enough to do any type of organized sport, the first sport that I played organized was baseball. So I would say baseball was my first love. I started playing as the Yankees were winning 96, 97, 98, 99, playing Little League and, uh, you know, collecting trade them cards and, um, you know, just being a kid in the 90s when baseball was in a real like golden age. And then as I got a little bit bigger, a little bit older, I transitioned into being more of a football player. And then my love for football grew. And um, yeah, just really being able to play the sports, watch the sports and learn the sports all from a young age, I think is what really got me. So look at that. It wasn't even a situation where your pops or a family member, generally that's how a lot of young boys get into sports because they see what their grandfather or their father's doing. It was just Mm -hmm. something that you gravitated to from the start and obviously became what you became today as far as being the die in the wool rabbit sports fan that you are. Yeah, cable television. I give credit to my mom for having cable, my mom for buying me the gear, the gloves, the bats, the footballs, basketball, signing me up for, um, you know, bitty basketball, little league, peewee football, and just understanding that her son was obsessed from a young age. And yeah, my dad wasn't around. My brother was 10 years older than me, but he was not a big sports fan. He was a fan of some teams, but he, it wasn't like he forced it on me. I think I was just taken uh, by the television. And that's why I became a bandwagon front runner of a fan. I became a Yankees fan because they were winning in the, in the mid nineties, early nineties. I became a Cowboys fan because they were winning and a Bulls fan first before I ended up, you know, coming to my senses and realizing I wasn't going to chase Jordan to DC. And then, you know, being a Jersey kid, we had the nets right there, but yeah, I just, I had no real influence or guidance. That's good and bad. Right. Because uh, as a young kid, I just took to the sports on my own. My dad wasn't around to make me a fan of a certain team. My older brother didn't bully me into rooting for his team. I just, I did it on my own. All right. So now as far as uh, your fandom and before we even get into sports, before we even unpack all that, now your journey through broadcasting, I'm kind of curious to know what was it like? When did it start? What triggered it? Because I know you mentioned you played High school football was maybe the NFL a thought or was it just a thing where you just were so much into sports that you just played and that was it? You had no aspirations of making it to the NFL or maybe there were. So I'm kind of curious to know before you even got to that point where you started to get yourself on the radio and started to get yourself out there. Was there a future possibly in playing professional sports? Yeah, unfortunately, I peaked at 12 years old. Um, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> My best football season was in the sixth grade. But in the sixth grade, I had people telling me, hey, you're pretty good at this. And I remember the first uh, parent, uh, my friend Chris's dad, kind of pulled me to the side and was like, you realize if you keep this going for another three, four, five years into high school, like you can go play college football. You can be a scholarship athlete. I had no idea what that meant. Um, but playing Pop Warner football from age 10, 11, 12, 13 – People in town started to realize that I was fast, that I was I had an arm. I played quarterback. I was like one of the most athletic kids on the team. I would score two, three touchdowns a game. So I did start to dream about going to college, playing football and potentially going to the NFL. But around the same time that I was in high school, getting recruited, getting letters from colleges, people started saying, what are you going to major in when you go to college? You talk to guidance counselors. They're like, what do you think you want to do? And I remember talking to a doctor who who did my physical and he was like, you're not big enough to be an NFL player. You're not going to grow much bigger than this at like 16. He's like, use football as a vehicle to get your education and take you to your profession. Still didn't understand what all that meant. But around the same time, I was offered an opportunity to call Pop Warner football games for the Pop Warner Football League in Ocean Township that I played for. And that was my first time getting on a microphone getting on the loudspeaker, hearing my own voice, which everybody has to defeat their own thoughts of their own voice. You you have to get over the way that you sound. You're not going to sound the way you sound to everyone else because your mouth is in between your ears and you're internally hearing yourself. But anyway, uh, I remember doing a 
Pop Warner Sunday, Junior Pee Wee, Pee Wee, Midget football games. I want to say I was paid $50 for the day to stay up there and call three football games. And one of the parents came up and was like, you have a good voice. You know, I can, we, we know you're young. We know you're trying this out, but like continue. Maybe you should go to school for communication. See if you can get into broadcasting. And I, I didn't understand what communication meant, but I was a big sports center ESPN uh, watched all the games, of course, pretended to call games type of guy. So when I did actually get a scholarship and go to school, I went to James Madison University undeclared, but I started to dabble in their communication department, but I made the mistake of going communication PR, public relations. Didn't like that at all. I spent three semesters there. My first year undeclared, my my sophomore year, that first semester, I did a little bit of PR, hated it, hated playing football there, and I transferred home to Monmouth University. And the biggest thing about going to Monmouth University, you know, I didn't think I was going to go to the NFL. I knew guys like Miles Austin had come out of there or whatever, but I knew that they had a radio and television studio on campus. They had what was called Hawk TV, which streams in all of the dorms and all of the buildings, the campus television network. And then they had WMCX 88.9 FM, which you can literally ride around in the area and pick up on the FM dial. So when I transferred home, to Monmouth University. I was a fish out of water in the South. I wanted to be back home. Monmouth had just give, started giving out scholarships. I went there. I sat out a year. I told the coach, I'll play whatever position. I, I went from being a quarterback at James Madison University to just trying to get on the field, catching kicks, catching punts, playing receiver, playing scout team quarterback in practice. Wasn't really enjoying that either. So I just partied and went to class. And then my fifth year, I gave my scholarship back. And I said, okay, I'm really going to lock in. I joined the radio club the year before. I did more hours on the radio the summer of 2011 when I wasn't playing football. I was on three to six, Monday through Friday. I did a, a music show called M Squared on Hawk TV. And that's when I really started to get the itch. Like, okay, I think I could be on camera. I think I could be on air on the microphone. And uh, when I graduated, it was quiet for me in 2011, but some 11 years later, 10 years later, I broke into WFAN. And then at the same time, I got a gig at MLB Network. So it was like a decade later from 2011 to 2012, fast forward to 2021, 22, I did it. But in between, I did a bunch of odd jobs and things. I DJed, I emceed, I was a promoter. I drove over 700 Lyft Uber rides, did Uber Eats deliveries. I worked at a restaurant. And really what, what you know made me money and the way I survived in New York was being a social media manager, digital marketing manager. And I got that opportunity coming out of the MLB fan cave. So um, whenever you hear me talk about that on the radio in 2014, three years after graduating, I auditioned for the MLB Fan Cave, and I got to be the Yankee fan in New York City with um, seven other fans from different places representing the Yankees in Derek Jeter's final season. MTV had a show there, and when I got out of there, I applied to a social media coordinator job at MTV. One person recognized me, noticed that I had Fan Cave on my resume, brought me in. I, I crushed the interviews. I got the job. I worked there for almost three years. Then I worked at Fubo TV, which everybody knows now, but I was one of the first hundred employees hired, their first social media employee hired in 2017, 18. And then I left there and went to Rock Nation, Jay-Z's um, record label slash sports agency. And I worked specifically with the NFL clients doing their digital marketing. I was logging into like Todd Gurley and Leonard Fournette's Instagram to post Gatorade or Under Armour stuff for them. And I only worked there for like three months, the summer of 2018. I did not enjoy it as much as I thought. It was a grind. Um, I wasn't fulfilled. And I was seeing a lot of people rise on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. This is before TikTok was even big. Podcasts. And I'm like, okay, all of these people are creating content. I think I'm going to apply what I learned doing social media for brands and for athletes to build my own brand. And I'm blessed to say that it only took a year before the Yes Network gave me an opportunity to be in some commercials and do some things. And then two years after that, I got my first full-time media job at WFAN. 
Wow. And I want to go back when you said that you were unfulfilled, especially doing the NFL stuff. And for someone that's young, like yourself, to have the awareness to make that pivot because you figure that, hey, I'm doing social media for Todd Gurley and for Leonard Fournette. And even though it may have been a grind, and obviously it was, but to the standpoint where I'm sure most people would have looked at that like, oh, well, yeah, this kind of sucks, but I'm just going to keep going and see where this goes and so on and so forth. But for you to have the fortitude to say, ah, this isn't working for me and to pivot, kudos to you, number one, but also what, where did that come from, from a standpoint? Maybe that was from moms or maybe something that along your upbringing, because a lot of, not a lot of young people will be able to take that turn at that point in your life, considering that you're trying to move up the ranks, whether it's social media or even broadcasting for that matter. Yeah, it definitely wasn't my mom. I remember my mom was like, did you meet Jay-Z yet? I'm like, nah, I'm a scrub in that <laughs> office. I'm a peon. I'm a peasant. And that's the thing about social media. I did it for 2015 to 2018. So I did it for three years as it started to become a real tool in marketing. And similar to radio, they don't turn social media off. So you have to have programming. You have to have posts. You have to have someone engaging at all times. And what I found was I was being stretched too thin. Mm. I had a good salary there, but what I what I hated the most was that I was just like the guy that they threw at anything that needed to be the, the, like Photoshop. You need to make a flyer for uh, this running backs camp. CJ Procise, I worked with him when he was working for the uh, Seattle Seahawks. They're like you got to make a, a flyer for his camp. I'm like I don't make flyers. Right. Um, you know, Danny Green. Um, I had to help his brother do some things. And it's like, I felt like I was treated like a peasant. I was, I was at a cool place by title and name, but it was long hours. Um, since they had a, a LA office, people call your phone asking you to do things at 12, one in the morning. Hmm. And if you refuse to do something, you're in trouble. I think I turned 30 that year. And I was just like, this isn't for me. I'm like, I like, I appreciate the opportunity, but I was in there and out of there in three months. And wow. it was like a fight or flight type of thing. And I knew I'm like, okay, you quit this job because you were uncomfortable. You had this gut feeling. I couldn't sleep at night. I just didn't feel right about it. I'm like, this is not where I want to be. This is not what I thought it was. Um, I'm a manager level position at this job and they don't treat me like a manager. I'm 30 years old and I'm getting treated like an intern. Mm -hmm. So I said, forget that. I'm going to build my own brand. I'm going to start putting myself out there and I'll do whatever it takes from selling my Jordans on Facebook marketplace to random strangers, um, doing odd jobs, freelance photography, freelance videography, freelance video editing, you know, anything that I could do to hustle. Like I said, I worked at a restaurant. I never had any restaurant experience. I was just broke. And I needed some type of schedule, something to get out of the house. Um, I was applying to jobs to go back into the corporate world. And uh, my wife was like, you got to stop confusing the universe. Who do you want to be? You said you don't want to be that cubicle desk minion doing anonymous social media posts behind the scenes that you don't get any credit for. She's like, go full force into what you're doing. I think my wife, um, because, wow. you know, I, I come home and tell her she wasn't even my wife at the time. But I come home and tell her I quit the job. And there were definitely some times where she had to foot either most of the grocery bill or pay a bill and um, until I was able to hustle up some some bread. But uh, through the grace of God, it, it, it took not as long as it's taken a lot of people and not as long as I even anticipated to really start to be seen and really start to hit. And uh, it, was, it was the greatest career decision I ever made. It was the greatest career change I could have possibly done was to pivot out of my comfortable social media job, which right now I'd probably be a social media director making over $200,000 a year and be unknown. And maybe I'd be unfulfilled as well. Maybe I'd hate the job as well. Uh, I'm very happy in, in what I'm doing. Uh, it has its pitfalls as well, but I, I thank God every day when I pray that I like actually did it. Yo, I love to hear that. And I will say this, not to throw my name in the hat here or in the ring, but for what I did and having my wife's support, knowing that 
I'm pushing all my chips to the middle of the table, a la Aaron Judge prior to his walk year two years ago. Yeah. And it was a thing where I've been fulfilled. Yes, it's been a challenge. Yes, trying to hustle everything that you just mentioned. But being able to work at that cushy job with the benefits and the vacation and, yes, a steady paycheck, it's nice. But when you get to that point and just to hear that you went through that and your wife was also ultra supportive, kudos to her. And kudos to you for sticking it out and now getting to where you are today. So I just had to mention that. No, that's real. A lot of these young dudes, they're slaves to their phones. Um, they got apps where they can pull up videos on their phones of girls. They can swipe through girls on Instagram. They can get on these dating apps and connect with a girl every day. Right. Um, that's cool and all. I have my fair share of women as well. But uh, you need somebody to be your better half. You need somebody to have your back. Life is hard. And if you don't have a partner to go through it with, uh, it can be even harder. And so, like, my wife found me in college. My wife was the one that told me during this, if you want to be the man, be the man. Stop confusing the universe. Are you trying to be Keith McPherson out here in the media in New York City? Or are you trying to be behind the scenes? And, you know, she sat in class with me. She watched me do presentations. She took some of the same classes and courses. You know, I had a better grade in radio. I had a better grade in TV. She was in the same communication department, but she was PR. So yeah, shout out to the wives, shout out to the women that hold us down. Uh, we're in a strange time now where you can, uh, you can get an Insta date. You can swipe on Tinder and, and connect with somebody. But yeah, like I said, life is hard. You need somebody to have your back. No, hundred percent, man. I totally agree with that. And it's interesting you mentioned about branding before we talk about FAN and then obviously Yankees, which I'm sure you're probably ecstatic right now, or maybe who knows, maybe you're cautiously optimistic considering other than uh, this they win, did they finish the game? They've, I don't want to say bottom of, out, but considering bottom of the smart. bottom of the ninth, Yankees are they're they're close here. Uh, they're well, it was six four, away. top eight last I checked. So yeah, it's six five. Clay Holmes is in. I am uh, uh, beads of sweat. <laughs> yeah, I'm monitoring that while we chat. No, I hear you, man. Hey, listen, no offense taken. I totally understand. But as far as the branding aspect, and that's the one thing that a lot of people, when they hear about that word, the brand, and for someone like yourself, that yes, you have to put yourself out there, just like for what it is that I do. I got to, and I know I need to do more of that. Of course, you could get a million different blueprints, et cetera, and what's going to work for you may not work for somebody else. But what was the one thing, like you mentioned, selling your Jordans on Facebook Marketplace, but what was the one moment during the process of branding yourself that it finally caught on and people started to realize who Keith McPherson is? So I did a lot of different things in the Yankee world. Being in the MLB fan cave was a huge break for me professionally, and that was 10 years ago. Hmm. I was able to take that and connect with a group of Yankee fans that had a popular Yankee blog. And what I would do was do video content for the blog. Me at Yankee Stadium, me at PNC Park, me in Philly, me in Chicago. You know, like, hey, Keith McPherson doing an Instagram takeover. Come with me as we watch the Yankees on the road. So then I started to gain some followers that way. But I kept my accounts, like, pretty private and didn't accept everybody because I was still doing social media work for MTV and for these other companies. And I didn't want my bosses to see me like getting drunk at a game or like, you know, getting into it in the bleachers with fans and stuff like that. They had a popular podcast in 2017 and 18 and they wanted to branch off because they saw the business and the growth that was coming from putting ads on the podcast and the reach and how many downloads. So they asked me, Hey, you want to do an, um, you want to do our secondary podcast? And I didn't want to do it. I, I didn't get paid to do it, but I did it anyway. And I'm I'm glad that I did because that was my first like reigniting Yankees win. Yankees. Oh, win. All right. <laughs> get a sweep five in a row. Yankees win. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's I'm all on. good. Yeah. Fascinating. And to think who knows the jump start of this streak Mind you, the game on Saturday night when they were down 8-6, but the trade for Jazz Chisholm, for, I don't know what it is. It's uh, electrified the lineup for sure with his uh, presence. And who would have thought out of all people, Jazz Chisholm was going to be the one guy that kind of turned this season around. But 
You love to see it. It's way better than anybody could have anticipated. I know it's going to have a drop off. I know he's not going to stay this red hot, but I mean, I think he's a, a good addition. But um, yeah, so back to what I was saying, huh. I basically leveraged the following and the eyes and ears that this existing Yankees blog had. And the messed up thing is like, I didn't get paid anything for it. But I started to get popular from the podcast. I did one season. I did a 2019 season. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to, like, expand more into my ideas and my personal brand. And they weren't interested in doing business with me. Cool. See you never. Um, literally cut all ties with them. Still don't talk to any of them. They all are very aware of me and where I've gone and what I've done some five years later. Mm -hmm. But I was able to take that. And get noticed by the Yes Network in 2019. And the first big break for me, I literally cried tears of joy. I got invited to a suite at Yankee Stadium. Yes Network made a list of like the top 10 people you should be following on Yankees Twitter. Like diehard Yankee fans putting out Yankee content. Wow. And when I went to the suite, I had no idea who was in the suite. But, you know, I just... When I walk into a room, I look everybody in the eye, I shake their hand, I try and get their names. I'm going to forget their names, but I try to, you know, just kind of move around a room in a way where everyone there, uh, you know, knows that I, I care about who they are and I'm not, you know, just off into a corner. And it's like, you know, a way of networking. And I guess that worked because by the end of the game, one of the producers was like, hey, I got a pitch for you. It's called Fandom Acts of Kindness. It's you in New York City walking through the streets of Times Square, giving out Yankees merch, celebrating uh, the Yankees making the postseason in 2019. We're going to call it Fandom Acts of Kindness. You're the fan looking for other Yankee fans spreading the Fandom Acts of Kindness. I'm like, wait, you want me to do it? <laughs> right. They're like, yeah. They're like, that's our idea for we need a commercial promoting the Yankees going to the postseason. And that's our idea. Would you be down? Of course. The first one I did for free, just for the opportunity, and it was great. It, it turned a lot of heads. It got a lot of buzz. And then they wanted to do it again. That was September. They wanted to do it again in December, and I played the game, right? I asked for some money in December. I was unemployed. I asked for some money in December. I did it, and they paid me, and I had two of those commercials, and that those were my first big breaks. That That's like me being followed around by a camera crew in New York, people asking, who's this guy? Who's this? And then my family, my wife, my friends being able to turn on Yes Network and see me twice, September and December, in commercials. And I remember eating, um, you know, a little steak dinner with the crew at Yes Network after the first one. And one of the producers cheers and he said, here's to launching Keith McPherson's career. Wow. I didn't know. I didn't know as much as they knew at the time. At the time, I was doing freelance social media work. I did sign a modeling contract where I was going on casting calls, but I had no work, no business really coming in. And I was hustling. I was driving Lyft Uber. I'd get up in the morning, six o'clock, drive people to work, drive people to the train. I'd come home, apply to jobs, eat lunch, go back for the afternoon commute and get on Facebook Marketplace, sold all my DJ equipment, sold some of my sports collector's items, sold a lot of my old Jordans that I kept in good shape. And I was just I was just hustling every day. Um, you know, making it happen. Wow. you know, mad inspiring. Uh, I will say that. And of course, now leading into FAN, because I know now you have the stretch here. That was what, 2018, 19, and then 2021 is when you now really are thrust into the cauldron, not only just of sports talk, but getting a chance to work at, of course, the iconic WFAN. Kind of walk us through the steps of how that took place to where you've been there now three years. Yeah. So, you know, um, the the group I was just speaking of that I did the first podcast with, I don't even mention them because they're irrelevant now mm -hmm. and not even in like a, a, you know, animosity or negative type of way. I just they don't even deserve like I don't even I really try not to speak about them, period, because they like they tried to play me. And, you know, karma is interesting. Like they yes. treated me like I was nothing. And now they're nothing. Right. But everybody knows John Boy. And I remember being on Yankees Twitter and seeing the emergence of John Boy. I was a fan of his. I supported him. I outwardly tweeted about this guy's chasing his dreams. And I remember when he quit his job as a wedding photographer to start making content 
podcasts, videos, breakdowns, and he started to blow up. So fast forward to late 2019, I run into him at Yankee Stadium a couple times. We exchange numbers. And then in early 2020, he, I find out he's got an actual company. He had an angel investor put up, you know, like $25,000 and then they started making money and then they got more investors and they got some capital. And then next thing I know, he's opening an office in the Bronx, a five, 10 minute walk from the stadium. Right. He asked me if I was interested in working with them. Really, I, you know, we just were talking and I'm like, hey, I'm available. Like, I'm not doing that podcast with the other group anymore. I'm unemployed. I went on a, my last interview was December, like 19th. I was almost hired as a senior social media manager at Spartan race. And they oh. couldn't, they couldn't come to terms with the creative agency that brought me in there. There was like a $10,000 difference on my salary and the cut that the creative agency was going to take. And so they pulled the rug from under me. I had a great interview. I left thinking that I had the job the next morning, the guy that I interviewed, sorry, Keith, we can't bring you in. So I was really just like, F it, I'm done. I start talking to John boy and he's like, yo, next month we're going to shoot a video announcing our office in the Bronx. I'm in that video. I look like I'm a part of the team. I'm not officially a part of the team yet. But after that video goes viral, really on YouTube and Twitter, he's like, we want to bring you on as an intern. You know, we know you're not working. You've already done some cool things with us for us. We want to bring you on with the intern salary, $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. Great. It's something. And it's something yeah. I love, sports content, video editing, podcasting, great. Fast forward to March now, I'm killing it. Now I'm doing everything. I'm doing the YouTube channel under John Boy Media. I'm doing the Twitter handle under John Boy Media, the Instagram handle. I'm helping them do all these different things. I'm building the office, building chairs and desks. I'm, it's all coming together. The pandemic hits mm. and things get weird. And they continue to go into the office because the office was in a residential building. So residential buildings where people lived, they didn't get closed down, but office buildings did. They were still able to work during the pandemic and create content for a captive audience, a literal captive audience. People weren't going anywhere. I stopped showing up there. I stopped going to work, but I, I did what I could remotely. Um, my wife had COVID like the first week that it became a thing. Her dad had it. I just wasn't playing around with it at the time. I'm like, but rather not risk it. And I think that caused a little bit of a rift between my relationship with those guys. I really don't care because they also looked down on me. They also thought I wasn't good enough to be on camera, wasn't wow. good enough to be on the microphone, saw me as a straight up behind the scenes video editor, poster, whatever. Um, but I had a podcast with them called Talking Nets. And then I also did a Yankees podcast with Joe's McFly called Pinstripe Strong. Both were successful. Both had followers, downloads. Kevin Durant followed Talking Nets. The Yes Network came and shot a special on us. Pinstripe Strong, we got featured on New York One News. Our live streams were taken off. And, um, you know, things were booming. Here comes 2021 now, and things are starting to come back to life. We're getting back in the stadium that April, May, June, July, and August comes. We're in the full swing of things, and... John Boy and Jake get the opportunity to take over Moose and Maggie's midday show 10 to 2. And what they did was go in there and host it like it was a Talking Yanks podcast. I was extremely proud of it. I helped them clip it. I helped them post it. I helped them promote it. And I was like, wow. I remember writing a post like it was August 6, 2021. I'm like, this is amazing. We went from being, you know, fan made social media to the actual media. Like, podcast and YouTube to actual New York radio. And I'm like, anything is possible. I went to school for radio and television. This is the closest I've ever been to the radio and television. Like we're on our way. Fast forward two weeks, not even fast forward a week. Spike Eskin sends me an email asking if I'd like to audition at WFAN. I didn't think it was real at first. I had to look him up. I look him up. I see who his dad is. I put two and two together. I'm like, okay, this is legit. This guy just got the job as the program manager at WFAN. He's looking for new talent. I start listening to WFAN more, and I'm hearing everybody campaign for um, the nighttime job. And uh, my audition was August 25th. I thought I was terrible. I was nervous. I thought I sucked. I had this whole long agenda kind of telling, you know, the same story I told you to the audience. Like I played sports. I did this. I did that. I went to college. 
You know, I worked at these jobs. I grinded to get here. I didn't just fall out of the sky. A few weeks go on, and Steve Summers is ready to do his final schmooze. Mm -hmm. I'm in Puerto Rico with my wife. It's early November. I owed my wife a trip to Puerto Rico after the baseball season was over because after we had got married that year, we went straight to the All-Star game. WFAN Spike calls me and they're like, listen, we're going to break this news. Steve is ready to do his final schmooze and sign off and announce that you're coming in. When are you coming back to New York? I'm like, not for like two, three days, but run it. Go ahead. Announce it. It hit the New York Post. It, 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 it hit social media. And I'll never forget that day. I remember crying real tears like, yo, I actually made it. They called me in the Carton and Roberts show. I'm in Puerto Rico. It's beautiful. I'm with my wife. Um, I'm getting all of these texts and calls and tweets and like, there's so much negative reaction. People talking about how WFAN sucks now. WFAN's failed. Look how low WFAN has, you know, gone. Like they're hiring this guy with no talent, no experience. Um, before they even heard me speak, right. uh, hell of racism, ton of racism because there just have, haven't been that many black hosts. There haven't, I'm the youngest host. I'm the only black host. You know, at the time I'm 34, I'm black, I, I'm wearing, you know, my, my fitted caps. I got the, the like, I just look like something they've never seen. So people hated on that very hard, but I'm used to it. Like I took it in stride and I knew once I get the feel of this, once I get some reps, I'm going to kill it. I'm going to kill it. And um, <laughs> we're coming up on three years next month. And you're getting swollen in the process. Now, it's interesting because the two things I want. That's right. <laughs> and keep flexing on them, Keith, no doubt. Now, the two things that you brought up, which I wanted to target, FAN. Now, I'm 55. And, of course, I've listened to FAN from the inception. And, of course, I haven't listened really over the last, I'd say, five, six years. To me, it has taken a bit of a turn. And, listen, I am not the – at times I could be the old man, get off my lawn. But I've gotten more into – the national scene, then more so the regional. And part of it is because the regional scene, other than the Yankees and the Knicks of late, it's really been bad. Nobody really talks hockey, although the Rangers have been good and obviously had a nice run here over the last few years. But with that being said, yeah, I've turned my attention away from just the New York sports scene. Of course, I do follow it. But it was a thing where, yeah, there was just something that I didn't gravitate to than I did even years ago. Although I have mad respect for Evan Roberts and what Sal does, et cetera. But it just – wasn't for me. So let me ask you. I understand you're not going to kill FAN. And 100%, I get it. But considering, do you see where there has been a little bit of a difference? And of I don't course. know if it's because of the personalities per se, but do you really feel that FAN's gotten a bad rap here? Or is there a little bit of truth to that when it comes to what has transpired over the last few years? There's 100% truth to that. But what I'll say is WFAN – just had so many iconic people that stayed in those seats for so long. It's hard to keep people in those seats now, right? There will never be another Mike and the Mad Dog. Mike and the Mad Dog, when they first started, they didn't even have Google. Mike <laughs> and the Mad Dog, when they first started, they didn't have cell phones. They couldn't go on social media. They had to come in there with notes and takes and fire, and they literally made it must-listen radio. Even guys like Don, Don Imus, he had his mistake that he made on the way out, but he was right. iconic. Steve Summers, who I mentioned, Steve Summers is old, man. He's 78. But, like, he's such an iconic voice that people were used to. People hate change. Even mm -hmm. Boomer and Carton, which turned into Boomer and Geo when Craig Carton went to jail. Right. And then Craig Carton comes out of jail, and he does a good job with Carton and Roberts, but then he leaves for the millions that Fox offered him. Yep. So there's been constant churn and change, even me coming in. We're never going back to what it was. And I equate it to like technology, technology advances and changes. And there's people that are going to always be like, oh, you know, even baseball. Oh, I miss the days of, you know, uh, the traditional baseball when pitchers went nine innings. We're, it's just never going back to that. Nope. And what I'll say about FAN is – They've had now three different program managers in the last four years. Mm. Finding the talent is hard when there are people in there 
holding on to those spots for dear life. And what I mean by that is like, like I always mention myself because people need to know that. I'm like, I'm more like the people listening than the people in here. I am blessed. I don't like to say luck because I, I did create my own luck. I, I, I worked for it. But the universe aligned for me. I am blessed that I got the opportunity to audition. Spike Eskin took a chance on me. I proved him right and he left. Mm. But the guys that you hear, Boomer, Gio, been there forever. Eddie, Reco, Al Dukes, been there forever. I'm talking 20 years. Yeah. The midday, Sal Licata, worked there for 20 years. He got kicked out, came back, but he interned, he part-timed. Yeah. Brandon Tierney has been in the radio space for 20 years. He did other markets. He did ESPN. Now he's back here with us. He was doing CBS. Now he's with us in the yeah. afternoon. Evan Roberts has been there 17 years. Tiki Barber's been doing radio media for, you know, 15 years. He's yeah. Tiki Barber. Sean Morash and Tommy Lugauer, they worked in that building all the way from intern to part-time to board op to producer to executive producer. Now you hear them in the afternoon because they've been in there. C-Mac, who comes on after me, same thing. He's been there 12, 13 years. That's how they have those spots. And – What's going to happen next, I don't know. Ryan Hurley, our new program director, will have to decide whether he wants to continue to hire from within or seek talent from the outside. Because at the end of the day, the audience is going to determine who is who and what is what. And if you're, you know, I think we have some good guys. I think we have a lot of talent, actually. But, like, you have to mix it up. It can't just be, oh, these guys got in here. Because you need diversity. You need diversity as far as backgrounds. You need diversity of thought, fandoms. You need diversity as far as like, it can't just be the same guys that have been in the building forever. Those are the guys that do all the shows. It's entertainment at the end of the day. People want to be entertained. There's a lot of entertaining people emerging in the social media world. That's why I'm happy that they brought in like an Al Cintrone. Al Cintrone is closer to me than he is the guys in there. Um, they're getting there. But I think what you're what you're experiencing at WFAN is we're, we're never going to have the Mike and the Mad Dogs, the Steve summers the craig cartons the you know don imus even the tony pages and some of the people that we used to have yeah. and what you're hearing for the most part is people that have been in the building for 12 15 years plus and they you know they understand the history and the fabric of what goes on there but they might not necessarily be the most entertaining or best people for the audience they're there because they grind it and they put in their time and they have tenure and then the next thing i want to get to like you mentioned, of course, here you are, a guy that's made your way in, created your own luck. And before you even step in front of the mic, a lot of people are already giving you the stiff arm because it's like, ah, now we're going to have this guy who's an unknown fill in for Steve Summers, who's been an institution at FAN and for everything I just mentioned. You have just the dreads and a lot of people are going to already automatically think that, oh, what is FAN doing? So on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The backlash that you had to absorb, I'm sure, from the beginning and almost have to build your currency with the fan. And it shouldn't matter skin color, look, et cetera, which is nonsense. But, of course, there are people out there that are going to think that way. What was that like for you internally to try to navigate that? And even though, of course, you're confident in your ability and that's what it's all about. But at the same time, knowing that you have to get that stamp of approval from the naysayers out there, which I'm going to get to later on from something else that you posted recently. But having to navigate that. What was that like and how were you able to overcome that? Comes with the territory. I kind of have always followed sports and media and and, you know, people that get this opportunity and people that get to sit in these chairs. It, it comes with a lot of criticism and scrutiny from people that don't know you at all. Mm -hmm. um, I'm blessed that, um, you know, I was raised a certain way. Um, my mom not going to college, wanting my brother and myself and my sister to go to college and be educated so that we would have a better life. Uh, my mom taking us out of a bad area, putting us in an apartment in a better area. You know, we went from having a house in a bad area to an apartment in a better school area, safer area, better school district. You know, I grew up in a predominantly white school, like 88 percent white people. And I think that makes me adaptable. I think that makes me someone that is prepared for racism. I dealt with racism from 
uh, elementary school on. I remember feeling racism so young, I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why I was being treated a certain way or discriminated against. But that hardens you. That that builds up a layer of um, protection and armor. And you know, the internet internet racism is so rampant. Oh. I seen you know, seen terrible things written about myself. But that's fine. I get the mic. I have the opportunity to change opinions. I have the opportunity to show who I am. Uh, I know my voice is a weapon. I know my speech, my vernacular, my vocabulary is a weapon. You don't get to the radio, right? It sucks because it's like people think black people are supposed to speak one way because they watch too many movies and, and television. Right. Or they watch, you know, too many um, hip hop videos and they, 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 they see an educated black man and they don't realize like, yeah, I went to school. I, I had to read. I had to write. I had to write papers. I had to pass. I had to give presentations and I, I couldn't go up there speaking broken English. I had to go up there and, and present in front of an, an almost auditorium of people and speak clearly. And um, that's that stuck with me forever. I'll never change that. Now, don't get me wrong. When I'm with the homies, I don't have to be so correct, grammar, correct, proper, whatever. But Not when I'm course. on a microphone, I want people to to hear me and understand me. So that's my way of defeating it. Uh, you know, the the ignorance that people have and that they spew is what it is. But I have defeated racism. I've defeated stereotypes. I've broken stereotypes my entire life. And I'll continue to. Um, I, I don't have a problem with it. I I wear it well. Um, there are so many people that wish they could be myself or wish they could be in my position. And so they project because they can't. And I, like that's the stuff I talk about online. It gets under people's skin. I'm like, Every day I'm reading someone saying, you don't know anything. You, you suck. You're terrible. Um, criticizing my hair or my speech or right. the fact that I'm black. And I'm just like, yeah, but I'm dope. I'm winning. Like, I get paid to do this, bro. I get to walk outside every day and be me. I get to get on air and be myself. You can't even be yourself online. You're afraid to be who you are online and real life. So life will pass you by. Keep criticizing me. Keep hating on me. You're only building me up. And that's the post. And here, we haven't even talked sports. And I got to be mindful of your time because I know you're a busy man. And, you know, we'll get to the sports in a second. But the last thing I wanted to touch on was that post that you put up as far as being yourself. Because obviously, there's so many people that wish they could be somebody else or would say they're living their best life, but we know they're absolutely not. And obviously, they're, all they're doing is just trolling or taking, trying to live rent free in your head or anything like that. And, that's something that I definitely, when I saw that, it certainly resonated because yeah. unfortunately there's a lot of people that are inauthentic and I know it's a, th a word that gets thrown around a lot and for you to eloquently put it there, but even more so in the video, which it looked like you were doing it while you are on the job and <laughs> telling everybody that, hey, you know, I understand that, you know, you feel a certain way towards me and that's fine, but I'm going to be me. I'm going to do me. And if you don't like it, tough. And just to hear that come from you and having this discussion with you, Keith, I just hope it resonates with a lot of other people out there who are either wishing or thinking whatever when they could just be themselves and not just spew a bunch of hate or follow people just to have these salacious or nasty comments about you or anybody else for that matter. And to me, it was just refreshing to hear and to watch when I first saw that video. Yeah, you know, I, it, it's a it's it's a process. I had to, quote unquote, defeat my own ego and mm. not being egotistical. But your ego, as far as what you think of yourself, you got to get over that. You got to get over what other people think about you or like, you know, oh, I look fat in this picture or I look old in this picture or I I, I, I don't, you know, I don't sound right. My voice, I don't like the way my voice, you got to get over that shit. Like you have to, you absolutely have to. People are going to judge you anyway. People are going to be critical of you anyway. Be yourself. I'm comfortable in my own skin. That's why I win. Like originality is winning right now because with these iPhones, with, with this social media, we can see so many more people. Back in the day, they could only see the people that were around them. That's it. Now we have a window into so many people. How do you break through? How do you stand out? Being yourself because everybody else is taken. You have to be one of one. I'm one of one. And my story just keeps growing and it continues to grow. And I, I'm going through all these things as I'm learning and evolving and changing and becoming. And I'm like, man, new levels, new devils. I got to stay grounded. I got to stay me. Because there are people that want to knock me off. There are people that want me out of my spot. There are people that are consistently hiding and hating on me. But they can't stop me. I, I'm already who I am. I'm 36 years old. I've gone through all this. I've built to this point. And like, if I have another 
uh, 25 years in this media space in New York City, I will be goaded. I will be forever. I will be an icon. I will be a legend. And like people talking on Twitter, that doesn't affect me. Like people right. saying negative things, that doesn't affect me. Well, like I said, what, about me walking into a room, like I have real love from people. I have real love from people in high ranking positions because they're like, nah, this is a good guy. He's genuine. He's real. And I have people in lower levels because I, you know, I, I treat everybody the same. So, okay. you know, my message to people is like, yo, now more than ever, you can be seen. And instead of copying someone else and trying to be someone else or even like faking like, you know, more than, you know, that's another thing. People are always like, you don't you don't know, you don't know ball. You don't know anything. Maybe I don't. But clearly someone keeps paying me and hiring me to to talk. I get invited to speak places. I'm, I'm on guest podcasts. I am on the radio. I'm hosting. Clearly, I'm doing something right. But I don't pretend to be a know it all. You can't know it all. I'm not old enough to know it all. I don't have the brain capacity to know it all. I know what I know. I know who I am, though. And that's good enough for me. And if it's not good enough for you, then I'm sorry. There's enough people out here that are embracing me, that like what I do, that love me. Like, the, the love overpowers the hate. So I just, no doubt. You know, I just know where I am with everything. No, and that's great to hear, man. It really is. Very refreshing, especially in this day and age where everybody just tries to fake it till they make it and everything that you just mentioned. And, of course, when people are trying to be something that they're not, you can see right through it. And therefore, yep. they may get those 15 minutes of fame. But then after that, it's just a nosedive down. So, all right, I got to be mindful here because I'm going to try to do this rapid fire. Obviously, sure. we talked about your Yankees before. And considering now they won five in a row, back-to-back -back series wins, including a sweep over the NL East Phillies. Now, do you think with the last month and a half prior to losing that brutal game Friday night in Fenway, do you think the Yankees now have turned the corner or are you still cautiously, cautiously optimistic considering the track record of Aaron Boone, more so in October than during the regular season? Or do you feel like maybe this is the time where the Yankees may take off, not to say run and hide, but get to a point where they can win a division and let's see what happens in October? Uh, this is it. The Yankees are back. They have turned the corner. They have been able to put together a five-game win streak, win back-to-back -back series, sweep the quote-unquote best team in baseball or the team with the best record in baseball on the road. The trade deadline's done. It is what it is. This is the team. This is the squad. This is the manager. This is the GM. Let's ride. They have a softer schedule coming up. They yep. can get fat on these teams under 500 as the dog days of August approach. They're going to get healthier. They're going to get arms back. They're going to get different players back, whether it's Jason Dominguez or Anthony Rizzo, Cody Poteet, Ian Hamilton, Scott Efros, Clark Schmidt, like help is on the way. And uh, this is it. I, I think they've, you know, as the amount of runs that they've scored, they've scored at least seven runs, I think in, in the last four games, six today, like now the lineup is hitting and the pitching is doing enough. It, it's time. It's time to make the push towards October. And uh, with this American League, you, you can't tell me that the Yankees can't come out of the American League. There's no team that is just head and shoulders above everyone else. And it's crazy because a week ago this time after that debacle, and listen, I'm not one to gloat. I've never been. I'm a huge Met fan, been since birth. But I was even shocked by the turn of events. And I even saw what you, what you said last week. You're saying, that, hey, you were just honest in your assessment of how those games went down and not to go back to that. But my point is, is that, what a difference a week makes to see what happened there last Wednesday at Yankee Stadium and then go to Fenway to lose that first game. I'm sure you're saying to yourself, yo, the sky is falling here. What's happening? And then yeah. all of a sudden it went from thunderstorms and even some hail to now it's bright and sunny and blue skies ahead. Rock bottom is losing to your crosstown rival and your division rival in the same week in the fashion that the Yankees did. That first 3-2 loss – where you run out Jamai Jones as the leadoff hitter and J.D. Wow. Davis as the cleanup hitter, and in yeah. a week you DFA those guys, that's that's despicable. It's embarrassing. Then you get pummeled. You get beaten to a pulp in front of your fans in your building. They're laughing at you. They're, they're just tagging you in the eighth inning. People are leaving their seats to go home. Okay, you get a day off. You go to Boston, and you fight back. You have that game. Judge hits a 470-foot bomb, yeah. and Clay Holmes comes in there, and you blow that one. Those are three losses that stand as rock bottom for this Yankees team. Worst loss of the year as far as run differential. Worst loss of the year as far as having it and blowing it and just the feeling of that. They've turned a corner. 
They were able to fight and, and steal that game from the Red Sox Saturday. They followed it up Sunday night on Sunday night baseball. They go into Philly. They take these three with Jazz Chisholm on the team. Uh, I think you're now looking at a Yankees team with a better lineup with, with multiple arms on the way. We'll see what happens with the rotation with, with Cole coming back from the stomach bug and um, Cody Poteet and Clark Schmidt trying to figure it out. Nestor Cortez survives the trade deadline, but no, this is it. This is the Yankees team for 2024. And I think they're good enough to get to the world series. Absolutely. And like you said, Soft on the belly of the schedule on the way, considering the last month certainly was a bit of a gauntlet. Dodgers, Braves, if you want to throw in the Mets, you could say that too. And now that they're steer clear from that, let's see how they perform from here on out. All right. One other thing in reference to the Yankees, because I know the roll call, when they chanted your name, I'm sure that was something that, did that come by surprise? Was that something yeah. that you heard some rumblings about this was going to happen? Please no. share that. The creatures are real. Um, I, I love the creatures because it's like a Yankee stadium fraternity family, um, the core of the fans for years, decades. Like there are 80 year old fans. There are eight year old fans in the creatures and the creatures have a Facebook chat. They have an Instagram chat that I'm in and I no one They kept it from me. Um, Mark, who leads the roll call, and Tina, who we consider the, the queen of the bleachers, who started the bleacher creatures back in Section 39, the old stadium, they put their heads together, and they decided that first game that I sat in for Susan Waldman, they would end the roll call with a Keith McPherson chant. I'm live on air. I'm hearing it in my headphones. I'm seeing it. I have my binoculars. I see the gang chanting my name. I didn't play for the Yankees. I'm not Donnie Baseball coming back as a coach. I'm not John Sterling retiring, which, you know, those are the last two guys to get their name chanted by the creatures that weren't Yankees active players. Like, yeah. that was everything for me. I clipped that video. That's my pinned tweet. When my son gets older and he comes to the stadium, he hears the roll call. Like, I can't wait to show him that. Uh, that was everything. That was awesome, man. That was – I almost cried. I, I literally almost broke down. And I'm like, all right, I got a, I got a job to do. This is my first time ever calling a baseball game, let alone the Yankee game. And these guys got me choked up because, like, that's just another thing. Like, I've made it, dude. Like, I'm watching the game from Susan's chair. There are people watching this game all over, and they're hearing Keith McPherson chanted in the bleachers in 203. It's crazy. And how did that come about real quick as far as you filling in for Susan at one time? So I, I, I didn't ask to do it. I've never called a game before, but, like, my popularity is mm -hmm. obvious and it's like, you know, that's not even me flexing. It's just like no, no. because of what I've done out here from the fan cave to go into games to Yankees podcast to hitting WFAN, I'm revered like more so than any other Yankee fan on our station. BT is great. Morash is great. Mm -hmm. C-Mac is great, but they don't exist like I exist in that stadium. They don't exist like I exist with Yankee fans online. So that was a quick pop. Let's see what let's see what happens. Let's see if it works. And the Yankees are the one ones that had the idea. The, the Yankees brain trust, their brass, their front office said, throw the kid in there. Throw him into the fire. Let's see what he does. Wow. No, that's incredible, man. And I'm sure, like you said, just to kind of keep it together there while they're chanting your name out in the bleachers and knowing that, yes, you have to keep it together because it's easy just to kind of like get up and just if they could even see you from out there, if somebody had the binoculars to wave or whatever, uh, that must have been an experience that, like you said, you'll obviously never forget. All right, let me do some rapid fire before I let you go. Dream interview guest. Doesn't uh, matter Derek, what sport, whatever. Who Derek Jeter. I just never gotten. I've been around a lot of different guys. I've never gotten close to Jeter. I've had a couple opportunities. Derek Jeter. Definitely want to um, talk to Jeter. That's just the first one top of mind. Derek Jeter, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, hey, uh, that's as good as it gets right there. Now, I know you mentioned being a Net fan. If you were Sean Marks, and I understand it's going to be a long journey we've seen here over the last few years, considering what had just taken place a few years ago with the KD Kyrie experiment, how long do you think this build is going to be, considering the way the East is right now with Three Boston, years. Philly, Milwaukee, et cetera? 2024 into 2025, 25 into 2026. By the time the Nets are in 2026, 2027, they will be competing in the East again. Um, they have their picks. And they have young talent and they have their coach. I think you give him two seasons with these young players. That's all you're going to need in three years. They're going to be competing again. They're going to be a, a top eight team in the East in three years. It's going to shift. It's going to change. Um, 
three years I give this. No, and that's good. And hopefully that's the case because obviously it's going to be a Nick Town and it'll always be a Nick Town as we know. But considering going back to even the Mikhail Prokhorov days with KG, Paul Pierce, and that, how that experiment failed and then having to go through this, I'm sure hopefully they do it the right way and build it to where this a little bit more sustainable. Now, as far as your future, now, of course, you're entrenched there at FAN. Is there anything else you'd want to do, branch out, kind of get into more so TV in front I, of the camera? I always do TV. I've, I've been doing TV. I've, I've done MLB Network as a full-time host on a show. I've done Yes Network stuff before WFAN. I've been on NBC News multiple times doing their sports final um, TV. I Not for nothing. People make the joke, you got a face for radio. I'm not an ugly guy. I'm not a fat guy. I'm not a ball guy. It's just almost a lot that, like, I will be doing sports conversations, sports media, sports entertainment on TV. The radio is great, but also the radio is old. And, um, you know, there will be, if it's not just TV, video content. Video content for sure. Now, what if Spotify gave you a sweetheart deal a la Alex Cooper or, dare I even say, someone like Joe Rogan? And I'm sure, hey, it's all about the money, but to know that you would have full autonomy of your show considering your popularity, et cetera, is that something that you would be open to? Or considering, like you said, with radio and how that's of course maybe a thing in the past, of is course. that even a I, possibility? I'm tired right now, bro. When we get done with this, I'm going to try and take a little power nap. I'm going to hit an energy drink. Then I got to drive into the city. I don't want to be on the radio till 2 a.m. forever. I don't want to be Not on the here. radio till... 12 a.m. forever. There's definitely in my future an opportunity where a Spotify or a FanDuel TV or a Wave Sports Entertainment says, yo, you're great. We want to make a show for you. Audio, video, YouTube, podcast, streaming, where you film it during the day and you bang out content and you interview guests. And I also want to do more than sports. I want to do music, hip hop, culture. Yeah. Uh, I want to let people in on being a father, fatherhood, dad life. Uh, I'm into fitness. I'm in the gym. I want to show people what it's like. Like, yo, I get it. I get it in. I, I'm a former athlete. Um, fashion. I, I got a closet full of picks. I sold 15 pairs of my Jordans. I got another 25 pairs in the closet. Like, there's more to me than that. And, and the biggest thing I want to do is um, public speaking and motivational speaking. And uh, I'll do it for free. Just sharing my story like I did with you just now for the last hour. And hoping to motivate and inspire some young people so that they can, you know, feel like they can do it too. And you know what? Let's just land it right there because I know you're giving me an hour. I'm leaving the slight past that. So, Keith, it goes without saying how much I truly appreciate your time. And thank you so much. All the best to you when, in whatever you do. You know I'm going to be following. All the success to you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jay, you were professional. You reached out. Um, a lot of people use the business email that I have for other things. I have done probably a hundred guest spots on podcasts over the years. I'm rooting for you. Um, tag me. I'll retweet this. I'll share this. And yeah, good luck with everything. Thanks for listening. Thanks for thinking of me. Once again, many thanks to Keith McPherson, WFAN, Sports Talk Radio host for sharing his story so I could share that with you, guys and gals. And I hope you found that as riveting, as compelling, fascinating, etc. Because, like I said at the top, I could have talked to him for hours on end. That's how great Keith was. And one more time, many thanks. And I appreciate him carving out that time for me so he could trust me with his story so I could share that with you guys and gals. Can't forget them as well. If you want to hear more discussions like that, Please hit me up with any suggestions, comments, whatever it may be on any of my socials, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, the J Reels podcast, also Twitter, X, J Reels, one, just a number. Of course, you have the YouTube channel at J Reels. If you have any suggestions for a guest or whatever it may be, a comment, compliment, even a critique, I'm open to it, people. So please go there. And not only that, but obviously I have to appreciate you. Guys and gals, for carving out precious time out of your day to listen to this discussion with Keith McPherson and for all of your support throughout all the podcasts that have been put out throughout the years. One more time, thank you so much out of the bottom of my heart. And again, support the channel one more time on YouTube at J Reels, as well as the podcast platforms that these 
are put out on, whether it's Apple, Spotify, the J Reels podcast, throw me a few stars, write a review. I would sincerely appreciate it. That's going to go a long way in increasing the visibility of this podcast to those who aren't familiar with it. So do your diligence, people. I would appreciate it. This is out of the love of my heart, doing what I want to, intend to, and love to. And that is talking sports, having discussions like this with talk show radio hosts, former athletes, current athletes, the broadcaster, the writer, blogger. I hope to get many more down the pike because that's where this podcast and this channel, that's the trajectory that I want to go to. So your support is immense in trying to get the word out, the name out, etc. So if you could do that, I would sincerely appreciate it because whether you do or do not know, this is what I love to do, people. It's in the blood, it's in the DNA, as I like to say, talking sports since birth. With nothing but passion, fire, energy, fury with my thoughts, opinions, critiques, praise, analysis, feelings on anything and everything. That happens on the world of the diamond, ice, gridiron, hardwood, golf course, racetrack, tennis court, boxing ring, octagon, you name it. From my lips to your ears, from my heart to your soul, from where I am to wherever you are, the J Reels Podcast always comes correct, direct, and in full effect. From the South Bronx to South Beach to South Central to South Pacific and all points beyond, peace, love, and God bless everybody. And until next time on the J Reels Podcast, on the flip, baby.